This morning, we will be in Acts chapter 9. And this morning, we will come to one of the most familiar stories in all of the book of Acts. And perhaps it is familiar to you. Perhaps it is not. In the Old Testament, God gave his people a law. God gave his people a law, and that law was sacrosanct. That law was above all other things. But as we learn in the New Testament, the law and following it cannot save you. The law cannot save you for a couple of reasons. Uh, and, and the main one being that we can't live up to it anyways. We cannot live up to it anyways. There's nothing, and, and I have my discussion from Sunday school still rolling around in my head, so the teenagers back there are probably being like, oh, this again. But uh, anyways, uh, it's what's on my mind, and how it relates to the sermon is just what's going to come out sometimes. We cannot be good enough. We cannot be good enough. So far in the book of Acts, we have seen the Holy Spirit fall on 120 people who were gathered. They were followers of Jesus. They were, they were so committed to Jesus that they were still gathering together even though Jesus had ascended into heaven. They had seen the risen Lord. In fact, many more than 120 people had seen the risen Lord, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. And then on the day of Pentecost, the fire fell, and instead of one Jesus to worry about, the authorities had at least 12 Jesuses to worry about, if not 120. And by the way, numbers often have significance in the Bible. Having 12 main apostles is reminiscent that the nation of Israel, God's people, started with 12 brothers that grew into 12 tribes. 12 is a number of God's people. And so Jesus comes and he's like a new Jacob, a new Israel, and he has 12 apostles. And even when we lose one because he was a devil from the beginning, Judas, we replace him immediately because we know that that number 12 is so important to show the world that this is God's true people. And God's true people were gathered in that other room 12 times 10. It was more than just the apostles. And then someday there is coming a day when Many of the earth will worship and follow the beast, the Antichrist, but God has already sealed his 144,000. 12 times 12 times 1,000. And I'm one of the ones convinced that that doesn't mean that God decided to stop there and 144,001 was too many. I believe it's a numerical symbol for God's people. God's, and they're twice as holy, two twelves. And they're almost infinite because really once you get north of a thousand people, you quit counting. Some of us probably sooner than that. I would. But 120 Jesus is now that the apostles have to worry about. And then we talked about last week, one of the deacons. We talked about for the past two weeks, deacons, guys that were appointed in Acts chapter 7 to help with the ministry load. And there's a whole lot more ministry going on in the book of Acts than we are told about. We get told just what we need to know, that Peter's important and that, and that uh, uh, what was happening around Peter and James and John was pretty important, but this is blowing up. This is going crazy throughout the city of Jerusalem. It is the underground current of, we don't think the authorities were right about Jesus. We think Jesus really was who he said he was, and, and they're having so much trouble. They appoint seven Greek-speaking Jews in order to help with all of the, the administrative issues, but what do we see two of them go out and do? We see two of them go out and preach the gospel. So it wasn't just the apostles. It was Stephen who spoke with great power and conviction. It was Philip who goes north to Samaria and performs miracles. And there is great joy in that city because Philip was there making such a big impact on that city. And, and uh, when Peter and John go north to Samaria to those awful Samaritans that the Jews looked down upon, 
They were there just in time to witness the falling of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues of those Samaritans to discover that God loves Samaritans too. God loves Samaritans too, and God saves Samaritans. And that's not a big deal to us. There's only a few hundred Samaritans alive today that follow that particular religion. Uh, but but uh, don't worry, we're getting to the salvation of the Gentiles next week. But as guys like Philip and guys like um, Stephen turn out to be super important and the first ones to, to uh, St- Stephen turns out to be the first to have the honor of dying for the faith and Philip is preaching everywhere. You can't slow the guy down. He's, con- he, he's here and then he's down south of Jerusalem and then he's along the coast and finally settles in Caesarea and, and, and everyone is moving everywhere and the persecution that breaks out in Jerusalem after Stephen's death sends the Christians flying. Now they know that they have power over death, but there's no sense in sitting around and tempting the thing, okay? And so they flee to other cities. That's probably how Philip wound up in Samaria. He said, Jews hate Samaritans. They're not going to look for me here. And and there are Jewish neighborhoods in every city of the Roman Empire at this time. And they have connections and they have family, especially all those ones that got saved, that those thousands of people that got saved at Pentecost. They probably overstayed what their plans were in order to become discipled at this point. But when persecution breaks out in Jerusalem, they scatter. And that brings us to that man who was approving of the stoning of Stephen, that Saul, that guy who is so wrapped up in his Jewish religiosity that he is actually going to be given permission by the Sanhedrin to leave Palestine, to leave the ancient land of Israel and go to other parts of the Roman Empire and, and, and bring letters of authority to those synagogues in those Jewish parts of town, in those other cities and bring any Jews preaching that Jesus is the Christ bound in chains back to Jerusalem. And uh, I uh, qualified for all district choir one year in high school and we actually had a song and I think it was um I think it was a cappella and it was based on the words of this chapter and told the story of Saul but some of these phrases we sang over and over and over again so if I break out into song please forgive me uh but we believe it or not it was bring them bound in chains bound in chains back to Jerusalem still echoes in my head it was. it was. It was a cool song. If I had, all I have is a recording at home, and I doubt if I could even find it. But if I had video of it, I'd probably show it to you. But uh, anyways, um, it, it makes for a very compelling story. As we talk about the salvation of Saul, I would like to point out one more thing in way of introduction. Uh, as he goes about, as the Apostle Paul, as he adopts his Greek name instead of his Aramaic home name and uses that as he preaches to Gentiles throughout the empire and writes so much of the New Testament as we are familiar with. Let's keep in mind that uh, in normal human circumstances, Peter or John or James would go on to be the leaders of this movement, right? They were there with Jesus from the beginning. They received their commission directly from Jesus. They are the natural leaders as we go about, as we, as we move through time here, the guys that can tell all the stories about Jesus, the guys that can, they were there, they saw the feeding of the 5,000, they saw the little girl, uh, especially Peter, James, and John, they were the three, the only three that got to go in the room and see Jesus raise that little girl back from the dead. Uh, they are the natural leaders. If anyone's going to be the forefront of the, the the theologians of that early church, it should be those guys. If anyone's going to go planting churches mightily throughout Asia Minor and the Roman Empire and be the guy that we are still quoting the theology of today, it should be Peter, James, or John. And John's a pretty good theologian. I love John. Peter, Peter's a fisherman. He yells at people till they do what he wants. and He's in charge. Boom. You need guys like that. Uh, and James, unfortunately, we, we're coming to the point where he gets uh, martyred. 
very early. So unfortunately, he doesn't get to do a lot of those things. Instead of Peter, James, or John, though, the guy who becomes the foremost theologian of that early church, the guy that go, that we know of, now lots of churches got planted, but we only get mostly the story of Paul. He's the missionary that we venerate. And who is Paul and what are his qualifications? He didn't walk and talk with Jesus all those years. In fact, we get introduced to him in the story of Stephen. He is a persecutor of Christians. He is on the other team. And even worse than that, you know, his qualification is that God saved him after Jesus came and lived on the earth. After Jesus trained his apostles for three years personally. And that's what's so encouraging about the salvation of Paul is that he gets saved just like you and I do. Peter, James, and John had a little bit of a unique thing. They travel and live with Jesus for three years, see him get crucified, see him risen, and then eventually also get the Holy Spirit. But they are the unusual ones. They are the only ones that live that life. The rest of us, for 2,000 years since, we hear stories about Jesus. We repent of our sins. We receive the Holy Spirit. And the fact that Paul becomes one of the main and central figures of that early church just goes to show what power you have through the Holy Spirit. The fact that I can get up and preach despite all my shortcomings. We, you think my sermons are long now. Imagine if I listed my shortcomings. Uh, and you, you can serve the Lord. And you can be like Philip. God says, go down to that road over there. There's someone waiting to hear about me. And you go there and God has prepared the guy. He's already reading Isaiah. And Paul, Paul takes the Holy Spirit. It's all that you need. By the way, I'm not saying that you don't need the Bible. That's the Holy Spirit's book. Let's be very clear about that. If you want to have the power of the Holy Spirit, be sure and read his book first. Like many professors, he wrote a book so we didn't have to repeat it all in class. Okay, so read the Holy Spirit's book and go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Whether you're a great, big, important religious guy like me or whether you are one of the grassroots people. It doesn't matter. Same Holy Spirit, same God, same power. You do not feel, we, we, we beg of you, don't feel less important in God's church. And sometimes when we feel less important in God's church, we don't like that. We want to feel important. Other times, we think it gets us out of responsibility. So yes, please, I am less important. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a deacon. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. Oh, guess what? Jesus didn't come all the way to earth to be born in the mud and live amongst us and die so that you could skirt your responsibilities. The Lord has a plan for your life. The Lord has a plan for your life and it may not match up with yours, but guess what? The whole thing about fearing God is learning to agree that he is right and that you are wrong, okay? So turn your life over to God. And speaking of which, we're gonna read about a guy he wasn't looking for God. He was convinced he already found God. He didn't make some great religious decision that now I think I'm going to follow Jesus. We're going to be talking about a guy who got knocked off his horse, if he was riding a horse, and spoken to from the sky. Paul was recruited whether he liked it or not. And God has a plan for your life, and God has a plan for the folks that you share the gospel with. God is after people. God is after people. And we are in a rebellious state. We are born in it. And we don't want to follow God. And, Peter, and Paul did not want to follow Jesus. But by golly, he came around. Jesus wasn't going to let him go. And so as we read this all-important story from the book of Acts, chapter 9, starting in verse 1. But Saul... Excuse me. Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I don't know if you can tell the songs back in my head, sorry. Uh, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what to do. Now we're going to read the whole story, but let's go ahead and pray for our reading and our sermon today. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us, O oh Lord, and we thank you for the words of this story. Lord, we thank you that you work through ordinary people. And we thank you that, um, Lord, the knowledge that there's nothing important or extraordinary about us until we meet you and you change that. Father, I pray today that Paul's testimony, though he is not here to share his testimony in person, but it will continue to do the work that you have appointed for it to do until the day that you come back again. And I pray that um, his example and your example above all in saving him would speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul's a bit of a go-getter. Back when uh, Stephen was stoned and we first meet Paul, I've always been a little confused by that story because they, they make mention of the fact that everyone who wanted to pick up a rock and throw it at Stephen laid their coats at the feet of Saul. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that he is in charge and he's the one that yells, get him, I'll hold your coat. I don't know. <laughs> this has always been a weird phrase to me, but then there's a phrase right after that that says, and he was approving of Stephen's death. So whatever it meant that he was holding the coats for everyone who wanted to stone Stephen, it doesn't matter. We introduce him in his shame. The shame of the fact that when the first martyr was being martyred, he was there and he was approving of it. And he's a go-getter. If, if he was just holding the coats for everyone and not throwing rocks before, he is now in charge. He is so incensed about these people going around claiming that Jesus is the Messiah and that everyone should follow him even to the death that he goes to the high priest and says, hey, if you're looking for a guy to go to Damascus and chase these people even further... I want to sign up. I would love to be that guy. I don't know if you've ever gone to a boss or something and said, hey, I would love to volunteer for, so many of us, we wait around until our boss tells us to do something, you know, but the go-getters, they go to the boss and say, hey, I think this needs to be done. Would that it offend you if I went and did that? And he does that for the high priest and he gets official letters of uh, recommendation and letters of authority to go to those synagogues and say, hey, if you've got anybody in here preaching this, this horrible false teaching that Jesus was anybody more than just a man uh, or that we should even follow him at all, I, I have authority here. If they're good Jews, they will let me bind them up with chains and, and, or, or maybe not let me, but I'm going to do it anyways and bring them back to Jerusalem to stand before the high council there in Jerusalem. And as he is traveling to Damascus, and like I mentioned earlier, this is probably the first in a number of cities that Paul wants to travel to, to grab all of these believers in Jesus. On his road to Damascus, he is struck by a great light. A light from heaven flashed around him, falling to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, as a good Jewish boy who grew up with stories of Abraham and Moses, when a voice speaks to you out of a bright light from heaven, that is obviously God. But this voice identifies himself as Jesus. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And suddenly, Saul has something to think about for the rest of his life. He was convinced he was doing the right thing. These terrible Jesus believers, they are going to ruin Judaism. They're going to carry us off into idolatry and God is going to punish us for our idolatry again, just like when we went off into the Babylonian captivity and Saul is going to prevent that. And yet the voice out of the sky says, you're persecuting me and I am Jesus. The 
Arise, enter the city, and you will be told what to do. Verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Paul rose from the ground, and though, although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So Saul has ha had a very uh, big thing happen, so much so that he doesn't feel like eating. He doesn't feel like eating for three days. He's got his whole life to think about. And I don't know if you've ever arrived at a moment like that. Um, we hear uh, in the news all the time of, uh, and the news only likes to ever talk about terrible people, but hopefully at some point they rethink what they're doing. And Paul has to rethink, man, I was so dead set against these Christians. And now I find out that Jesus really is God. I mean, that's quite a leap, right? They weren't looking for a Messiah who was God in the flesh. They were just looking for an anointed one who would come and lead them to victory. But this Jesus, he made several claims. Not only am I God's appointed one, anointed one, I am God himself. And of course, that was beyond the pale. That was ridiculous. And yet he just had an experience that forces him to admit Jesus is God. And he is... Uh, he, they take him on into the city. They don't know what else to do. He's obviously not going to do what he came there for. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. This is Ananias' only claim to fame. This is the only time we meet him in the Bible. And I've been making a big deal out of the fact that you don't have to be an apostle like Peter, James, or John, or even Nathaniel, or those other guys, you don't even have to be one of the seven deacons that they appoint, that everybody's doing miracles, everybody is filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and to prove that further, here comes someone who until this point has been a nameless believer in Jesus who fled to the city of Damascus. Until this point, he is nobody, right? Who is he? Was one Ananias one of the seven names that they mentioned. He's a believer. They're everywhere. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he is seen in a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Uh, every time God appears to someone and gives them a message, usually there's a little bit of pushback. You know, Moses says, I, I can't do all this. I st 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 stutter. And and uh, and here we have Ananias, and Ananias has been keeping up with the times, okay? Printed media and social media, we had nothing on the grapevine, okay? Y'all remember the grapevine? Uh, Ananias has kept up with the news before the printing press and before smartphones just fine. He knows who Saul is. Uh, he's, he has heard all about Saul. He's even up to date on the latest information that Saul has come here with official letters of authentication to arrest anyone preaching Jesus. And so he says to God, look, I know you're God, but I don't think you know how dangerous this is for me, right? I don't want to go do this. And you wouldn't either. I was listening to a preacher one time talking about when Paul got saved, and started coming to Bible study. Could you imagine if Osama bin Laden showed up to your Bible study? It was like, we're going to be praying with one eye open tonight uh, as we take our prayer requests. We don't trust this guy. Uh, but God could do it. Of course, he's dead now, but God could do it, right? And, and, and uh, you didn't see a title to this sermon or anything, but I thought I'd be clever as I titled it on the, the live that we're streaming right now, uh, Destroying the Enemy. How does God destroy his enemies? Well, there is a place called hell. And all those, it says in the book of Revelation, 
who uh, take the mark of the beast will definitely wind up in the lake of fire under torment forever with fire and brimstone and uh, in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. But here is Saul, an enemy of the saints, God's chosen people, the Christians, and an enemy of God. And God utterly destroys that enemy by turning him in to one of us. God converts Saul. Saul is no longer going to be an enemy of God, and God tries to catch Ananias up on the situation. And he says to him, uh, verse 15, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so God says, I have a plan for Saul. He is a chosen instrument of mine. God is not just wanting to recruit believers. God is wanting to recruit leaders. God was wanting to recruit leaders. And like I mentioned before, God has a plan for your life. Now, some of us will quit our regular jobs and we will go into full-time ministry. We will go to some other country. We will go and do uh, something that takes up all of our time for the Lord. But many of us also will keep the same job, keep the same family, keep all of those things. But now it is all rearranged in order to honor God. God. All of creation was created for the glory of God. And when we went into rebellion, we decided we would glorify other things. Your life glorifies something. Paul's life was about glorifying the law and the traditions of the elders. And by the way, that was just a way to glorify himself. The better he was doing in the law and keeping all of the rules and being a really good guy and being a really good Jew, it was all to glorify himself. He could point to all those things and say, I'm really good and God must very much approve of me. And like the uh, Jesus told a parable one time about a Pharisee, a religious guy who was at the temple, and he gave a prayer saying, Oh Lord, I bless you and thank you that I'm not a Gentile and I'm not a filthy tax collector like this guy standing next to me. And that's actually that's actually liturgy for some Jewish congregations. We thank you, O oh Lord, that I wasn't born a Gentile or a woman or a slave. And uh, and it's a bit controversial, as you can imagine, especially with that woman thing being in there. Uh, but uh, but Jesus directly attacks it there in the first century. He says, but the tax collector be doesn't even look towards heaven and he beats his chest and he says, forgive me, God, I'm a sinner. Now out of those two, who goes home justified that night? And the whole crowd's like, well, when you put it that way, Jesus, it's got to be the tax collector. He's sorry. The other guy's just full of pride. And so many times religious people like Saul are being religious and being good so they can point to what a good person that they are. And it is all to their own glory. But God says, don't be afraid of Saul. I've chosen him. He's going to be my instrument. And he has caused, and, and here's one of the things that we don't normally emphasize. He's caused so much suffering among God's people, but I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer to take God's kingdom further and further. He must suffer for the sake of my name. Verse 17. And if you know the story of the life of Paul, he gets he says he gets shipwrecked twice. We only have one in the book of Acts. So there must be one that wasn't recorded in the book of Acts. And he's always in prison. He gets beaten. And I, I mentioned a, a, a week or two ago something about, you know, why they always beat him 39 times. They thought 40 lashes would kill a man. So they just do 39 and beat you within an inch of your life. Uh, he gets beaten. He gets imprisoned. He gets shipwrecked. He gets all these things. And he suffers, but he counts it all joy counts it all joy that he is uh, that the Lord has taken him through all those things and that he was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, Ananias has changed his tune a little bit, calls him Brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. 
Then he arose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. Remember what I said about Osama bin Laden coming to your Bible study? This has just happened, okay? I kind of laugh a little bit at the apostles in Jerusalem who don't trust the word of the people in Damascus, but this has just happened. The disciples who have fled to Damascus are a bit wary of Saul, and yet they see, they see him. They see him preach the word and argue, argue with the other Jews who reject Jesus. Uh, back to reading here, verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Can you imagine attending synagogue on the Sabbath in Damascus? And some of, some of the Jews who have fled to that city are believers in Jesus. Of course, you got to go to synagogue. You got to prove to everybody that you are, in fact, a good Jew. Because uh, if you proclaim Jesus and then quit going to synagogue, well, there you go. Jesus is here to destroy Moses and the law and make us all apostate. But you've probably got the other side. They're already in Damascus. All these troublemakers, they came from Jerusalem. and They're going to cause this trouble here amongst our congregation here in Damascus as well. Oh, thank God they're sending Saul to do something about it. And then Saul gets there and he says, I have a message for everyone here. I met God on the road here. And he said, my name is Jesus. Stop persecuting me. This is amazing, right? Isn't God cool? Your, your, your helper who's going to arrest everybody shows up and he says, I'm one of them now. I'm one of them now. And not only that, but I've, and, and, and of course, someone who volunteers to go to another city and chase down these people, what kind of personality does he have, right? And now he's arrived and he's got the same personality, but a different perspective. And he start, he's, he's like a bulldog. He's, I don't know anything about bulldogs, but, you know, always looking for a fight. Always looking for a fight. And he's found a fight. And, he, and, and, and they say, now, wait a minute, Saul, aren't you here? Aren't you here to arrest these people? And, and, and he says, no, because, and just to take examples from the scriptures, I don't know what Saul said, but he made his arguments. You know, we always knew that there was a coming Messiah who was supposed to suffer and die. Don't you remember all those passages from Isaiah? We knew that a better Moses was supposed to come. We knew that a better Adam was supposed to come. And, and Jesus fulfills all of this. And even Herod's own scribes and lawyers knew that he was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, just like Jesus was. And, and there's all these people that have seen him since he died. And I can just imagine. Saul, newly saved, but already very educated. Just blowing all these people away. Just winning every debate. We live in an age when everybody wants to debate everything. Nobody wants to listen to anybody else. And some sad as it is, as much as we would all love to think that we like to listen to the other side and remain cool and calm and collected, I don't, I'm beginning to wonder if I know anybody that does that. <laughs> Myself included. But it didn't matter. Saul had the facts so he could win if you were going to keep your cool. And Saul was a pretty aggressive guy. So it was just a matter of shouting louder, which sometimes winning a debate is. Guess what? Saul was ready to do that too. In verse 23, uh, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, right? Now, that's how they thought they were going to solve their Jesus problem. That is, uh, that's how they thought they were going to solve this movement problem. The Christian question. If you remember your World War II history, they had the Jewish question. So they had the Christian question. They didn't even call it Christianity yet. It was just called the way. But uh, they thought, man, Saul has made such a dent in the city of Damascus. 
he is winning these debates. He is probably, it doesn't say that many people were converting, but my goodness, he has confounded the Jews. He is proving Jesus is the Christ. They said, we've only got one recourse. We can't beat him in debate. We need to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And so big intrigue kind of thing. Saul escapes the city of Damascus without the plot against his life succeeding. Verse 26, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him. Now keep in mind, the the big 12 have mostly stayed in Jerusalem and all of the other believers have spread. There seems to be, in fact, I've read at least one commentary back when, Peter and James and John were hauled in before the high priest, the the Sanhedrin. Uh, They were kind of given a little bit of immunity. Gamaliel II says, you know what, let's let them go. Let's tell them not to preach this stuff, but let's let them go. If it's of God, we couldn't stop it anyway. So maybe they had some kind of legal immunity because they had already interacted with the Sanhedrin a little bit. Maybe they were just so popular in the city that They were scared to do anything to Peter or James or John or uh, the other original apostles. But everyone else is scattered. But the original apostles are there in Jerusalem, and that's kind of a headquarters for Christianity at this point. And they like what they got going on. They're not going to mess it up by falling for Saul's little trick here of acting like he is one of the believers. At least that's what they think. But in verse 27, Barnabas took him. And who the heck is Barnabas? Have we encountered? Oh yeah, he gave the land. We have encountered Barnabas already. He gave the land. uh, He sold the land. He gave all the money to the church to help take care of all those people that had decided to overstay their visit to Jerusalem to be discipled after meeting Jesus at Pentecost. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, that's what the name Barnabas means, took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So went, so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, but they were seeking to kill him. And if you remember, that was the bunch that was seeking to uh, that killed Stephen. Paul had probably been working with them. It was the uh, it was the Hellenistic synagogue where where uh, Stephen had stood up for Jesus and declared that you know we don't need a temple anymore. We have Jesus and and God spoke to us and worked with our people so much before we even had a tabernacle or a temple. And they had risen up and killed him. But but Paul he's there and he's going to win these debates. He's going to see to it. Verse thirty. When the brothers learned this, uh, the Hellenists were seeking to kill him. Verse thirty. But when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Caesarea is a port city. And they said, Saul, we got to get you home. We got to get you home to your home city. Perhaps your parents and your other relatives that live there will not have the heart to try to kill you for what you're saying and preaching and doing. And so they sent him back to Tarsus, which is not in Palestine, but it is where he had originally come from. Verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And it's possible that Saul, no longer wanting to persecute the church, uh, landed the church in a relative period of less persecution. If he was spearheading the whole thing and all of a sudden he switches sides, uh, it says right here that the church began to experience peace. God is perfectly okay destroying his enemies, utterly. Destroying, that, that is what is planned for the devil. That is what is planned for the fallen angels, the unclean spirits, as the Bible calls them, the demons that you see in the New Testament that possess people and oppress people and all those things. Uh, the, the lake of fire was built for them, but We human beings who join their side, of course, we're born on their side. That's what the Bible very definitely teaches. We are born on their side. And, uh, but we have this opportunity to be forgiven of that and to switch sides. Jesus, when he died on the cross, 
he broke the power of the devil. Now, sometimes we have uh, preachers and teachers who talk about, oh, you can say this and you can, you can, if you, as long as you proclaim these words or you rebuke the devil out loud, it will, it will break the power of the devil, but you got to say it out loud. You got to do all these things. I'll tell you what broke the power of the devil. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We followed our parents, Adam and Eve, into, uh, you know, God gave us dominion over the earth. And the devil, when we decided we would follow the devil, that basically gave him dominion over the earth because he had dominion over those who had dominion. But when Jesus paid for that sin, it's, it's like a loophole. It's a legal thing. I know, that, I know that picking up a sword and hacking the devil into pieces is a whole lot more fascinating and interesting than the idea that we have legal power over the devil but the universe is one great big courtroom where God rules. And God's own rules say that because mankind is sinful, mankind must go to hell with the devil. But when God declared that it would be okay for someone else to pay that price, to undo the sin that Adam and Eve did, it broke the power that the devil had over us. He was able to point at mankind and say, they don't love you, God. They have rejected you, God. They are more happy fulfilling their own desires. They are more happy destroying themselves with addictions and idolatries. They are in rebellion against you. They have committed these sins. The Bible even describes the devil as a prosecuting attorney, laying out everything you've ever done wrong and saying they're not your children God and you know what the devil's not stupid he knows what he's talking about our sin separates us from God but in God's great wisdom and in God's great plan he sent someone who had no sin to pay the price for those of us that do have sin and and Jesus is described in the Bible as our advocate our defense attorney. And so when the devil's turn is over, uh, like in our modern courtrooms today, it's not quite the same, but it's very similar. Uh, it probably enough for our purposes this morning that our defense lawyer gets up and it's Jesus. And he says, these crimes are already paid for. Everything the devil said is true. You've done this. You've done that. You've lived your life in glory to this other thing. You've glorified yourself. You have worshipped false idols. You've done all of these things. You are in rebellion against God. But Jesus stands up and says, but this is one of mine. And for all of mine, I have paid the price for them. And there is no longer a crime on record for them to be guilty of. And it breaks the power that the devil had. And it binds him up. And he is limited. And, 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 and in medieval times, at some point, the, the Christians got this idea that the devil was ultimately powerful for evil and God was ultimately powerful for good. And there were these two equal forces always duking it out, always battling it out. And that is not biblical at all. The devil, we believe, is a created being. And I've got plenty of evidence from the Bible for that. And God is the only one who is all powerful. And anytime the devil acts, he is limited by God. And that sounds, uh, your first thought might be, well, then why doesn't God just do away with them entirely? God allows trials in our lives to test us and to help us mature. And God has an ultimate plan for when he ultimately will get rid of the devil. But for now, he is the thorn in our side. And God wants you to prove yourself faithful, just like Job proved himself faithful. God wants to show the world that the change that he has made in your life has worked and has been effectual in your life and you are now a different creature, not someone who gives up in the face of difficulty and adversity, but someone who perseveres, someone who has faith in God, someone who acts in that faith of God like Ananias. Oh, it's not a nice thing to ask Ananias to go and heal one of the greatest persecutors of our kind. And yet Ananias, once he heard from the Lord and got the message loud and clear in faith, he went and he laid his hands on Saul, his enemy. 
and saw God heal him. And Saul would have to live the rest of his life preaching Jesus, knowing that he had killed people for preaching Jesus. And I don't know if it kept him up at night. We saw a movie recently of someone trying to make a movie about the life of Saul, and that was something he thought about every night before he shut his eyes, the people he had persecuted. I thought that was an interesting take on that. Fortunately, at the end of the movie, when he's finally beheaded, as history tells us he was, uh, martyred for the faith, it's funny, you recognize all those same faces, but they all welcome him. Uh, it, they're all smiling this time, unlike in his thoughts at night when they're all glaring at him. Uh, they are all welcoming him as a brother into the presence of the Lord. And I thought, well, that's that's a really good take on that. I like that. But Saul knew he had been forgiven of great crimes. And he knew that the rest of mankind was still in bondage to the devil. And he knew that it was God's purpose for his life. It was even prophesied by the man who told him about Jesus, the Ananias who came and laid his hands on him after he had encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. And, and Ananias probably told him, the Lord said, you're going to be his instrument and you're going to suffer greatly for the cause of Christ, for the name of Christ. And Saul probably took that very seriously. And he went out and he did it. And he was always interested in the will of the Lord and the one time that they came, they wanted to preach throughout the province of Asia and uh, and God said no. God had a different plan and Saul obeyed, Paul obeyed. And, and uh, Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, no longer known by his Hebrew name of Saul, but known by his Gentile name because his family were Roman uh, citizens and they were they had a foot in both worlds and Paul probably already had this name that he used in Greek circles and in Greek contexts, this name of Paul. And he became known for that because he preached to Gentiles, uh, unclean, not God's people Gentiles. He saw many of them get saved and become part of the people of God. Planted entire churches of just about every one of them probably had both Jews and Gentiles in it. And he was always writing letters to them and and a great deal of, of uh, his time was spent convincing people that God will forgive you. You don't need to do other things. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to keep the law of Moses strictly in the ceremonial sense. You don't need to do all these things. You need to just let God forgive you because Paul was someone who had done all those things and was very good at it. And yet he came to a point where he knew that it had been pointless. And that he was still a sinner. What about you? Are you right with God? Do you have a standing before the Lord? Are you still someone living in the sin that you were born in? Or have you asked Jesus to come and forgive you? Let his sacrifice on the cross be effectual for your sin. And as I've said many times before. Perhaps you have zero background with the Lord and his church and everything. And, and so maybe you need to give your life to the Lord. Or maybe you're one of the many, many Baptists or other denomination that have been in church a long time and have been convinced like Paul, look, I'm very religious. And so I must be good with God. And yet you have never had the conversion. You have never met with Jesus like Jesus met with Paul and been convicted of your sin and repented of that sin and turned that sin over to Jesus and let his sacrifice be uh, uh, effectual for it, effective for it, that, that you would humble yourself before God and say that you are sorry for the things that you have done and that you want to live for him from now on and to turn your life over to Jesus and no longer be your own God, but let God sit on the throne of your heart. Let Jesus himself sit on the throne of your heart. That is what we want you to do. Paul was very religious. Paul was very religious and came to a point where he understood because of a supernatural encounter with God that that was not going to be enough. That only God can save. Only God can change a person from what they were to what God wants them to be. And we want God to do that for you too. Uh, we believe though, I cannot save you. I can preach and I can tell you 
about Jesus. And then what happens is the Holy Spirit starts to speak to your heart. And it's not because I'm persuasive. It's because God is powerful. And as God speaks to your heart and you know, you know that something has to change. Something is wrong. Something needs to be different. And that is what we have come to refer to as the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God urging you to lay down your life and, and, and leave it before God and let God take it up and let God do with it what he wants to do with it. Have you done that? Is the Lord speaking to your heart right now? That that is something you need to do. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to ask Randall and Judy and Robin to go ahead and come forward. During this time of invitation, we do it every Sunday, but that doesn't make it any less important. We inv- the, it's called an invitation because we invite you to respond to the sermon that you have heard today. And today has been all about salvation, the core of the Christian faith, how God changes us from someone dead in our sins a descendant of Adam into someone who follows Jesus and is alive in Christ. And I want, uh, I don't want you to simply make a decision today. I want you to listen to the spirit as the spirit is speaking to you. If that spirit is saying, go forward, make an announcement that you have heard the word and you believe and you have heard God and, and God wants to save you. I want to walk you through that. I want to talk to Jesus with you and, 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 and help you if you need help with the words to ask him to forgive you of your sins. Uh, but really it is God that does it all. It is God that opens your eyes to your sin. It is God that speaks to your heart and only God can save Humble yourself before the Lord. Repent of your sins. Walk away from that wickedness, no matter how much or how little of it you think you have. And believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will change your life. It may not all look like a good change. Saul is now going to face persecution. And he's got to sneak out of cities. And people are angry with him for proclaiming Jesus. And many times as we live for Jesus. We're going to have a similar thing. Even in a free country like America. Even when it seems like no one cares what we believe religiously. When we start espousing the truths of the Bible, it really messes with people's idolatries. But even with all that, God, I pray that God does not let you rest until you have given in to this prompting from the Holy Spirit that you would repent of your sin and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would be right with God in a way that only Jesus could provide. Come forward today. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to be singing, take my life and let it be. And during that time, if you'd like to come forward and share with me that you don't actually know Jesus, maybe you knew you didn't or you thought you did or whatever the case may be, come forward and share that with me. And I want to talk with you and we will talk to God together and we will get this figured out. And we've got deacons here. We've got other leaders. We've got female leaders. We've got people that want to talk to you and guide you through this transition process. But ultimately, it's God that does it all. So don't be prideful. Don't uh, think about how shameful it might be if in front of everybody you maybe admitted that you didn't know Jesus all this time or, or just, just don't give any concern. What other people think cannot be a factor anymore. You need to be worried about what God thinks and your relationship with him. Come forward today and make it public that you want to change that.